Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for Mechanics Institute Online. We're very pleased and honored to welcome you to our program, Old Ways and New Ideas, drawing upon traditional cultures to reverse climate change with author Malcolm Margolin, Paul Hawken and friends, including Michelle de Pena from the Pitt River Tribe, Susan Mastin from Yurok, and Claire Greensfelder, who's going to be our moderator tonight. Tonight's event is co-sponsored by Heyday and also the California Institute for Community Art and Nature. And we're very pleased to welcome those of you who are, are in our uh, audience from our co-sponsors. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to introduce a little bit about Mechanics Institute if you are new to our, our events. Mechanics Institute was founded in 1854 and we remain one of San Francisco's most vital literary and cultural centers uh, in the heart of San Francisco. We feature a general interest library, an international renowned chess club, ongoing author and literary programs, and a Friday night cinema lit film series. Now the library has been open, so we welcome you back to our building at 57 Post Street. And please see our website, milibrary.org for all the programs and listings, whether it's an author event or a writer's group or the knit club or uh, anything that you might find of your interest that's happening at Mechanics, some online and some on site. Also, um, we will have a Q&A, put your questions in the Q&A or the chat, and we will uh, we'll bring up those questions later on in the program. Um, also, Deep Hanging Out, Wanderings and Wonderment in Native California is available through heydaybooks.com. Uh, this is this wonderful uh, memoir by Malcolm Margolin. And also Paul's book is available um, Regeneration is available through your independent bookstore, alexanderbookstore.com. Uh, we'll, be, uh, we'll be happy to, to send a book to you. So um, I would like to first introduce our moderator. Uh, Claire Greensfelder is the Associate Director of California Institute of Community Art and Nature. And she's uh, engaged, she has been engaged in climate protection advocacy and collaboration with indigenous peoples in local to global campa campaigns since the early 1980s. She's participated as a delegate to 13 negotiating sessions for the UN Climate Conference since the preparations for the Rio Earth Summit in 1991. And she's also co founder of the Women's Global Call for Climate Justice. Claire is currently collaborating with Malcolm to develop innovative and joyful projects and programs for the California Institute for Community, Art and Nature. And we welcome you, Claire, and everyone on our panel. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura. And um, thank you to the Mechanics Institute for all your efforts to organize this wonderful uh, evening tonight. Uh, before we begin, I just would like to recognize that this meeting is coming to you from the um, physical locations of all our panelists from unceded lands here in the state of California, including the unceded lands of the Coastal Miwok, the Ramatush Ohlone, the Karkin Ohlone, the Nisanan, the Miwok, and the Yurok. And we are particularly honored tonight to have the participation of two of our indigenous colleagues from the California Indian tribes, both Sue Mastin from the Yurok tribe and Michelle LaPena from Pitt River. Uh, it's just um, tremendously honoring of Malcolm's work and book to have you with us tonight. And of course, we're especially thrilled to have our dear colleague and friend and longtime inspirational writer, activist and chronicler of all things that need to be done to make the world a better place, uh, Paul Hawken uh, with his new book. I'd like to, uh, I also will just say that I'm first going to um, read a, a welcome statement from Malcolm. Malcolm is really thrilled to see all of you here and we're just bowled over that uh, over 300 people registered for this evening. It's really impressive, not just because of the affection and love for these two authors and their books and our tribal uh, members who are doing incredible work, but also um, 
for your concern about climate change and to take a look at what traditional cultures can offer to it. We're very grateful for your interest this evening. Now I'd like to read to you an opening statement from Malcolm, who, as many of you know, has been suffering from Parkinson's for now almost 15 years and has made the tough decision tonight to not uh, offer his own opening statement because it might, um, might take a long time in terms of stumbles, but he hopefully will join us in speaking later, but he wanted the state opening statement to be smooth. So he wrote it out and um, I'm going to offer it to you in, in a language like only Malcolm can write. From Malcolm. First, I'd like to thank the Mechanics Institute for sponsoring this evening. They've been supporting Heyday Books and me and now California Institute for Community Art and Nature for some 30 years now, and it's so very gratifying. The Mechanics Institute is a unique institution, an independent intellectual force with surprising capacity to do things. And I really recommend that the listeners tonight take a look at their website and join as members. I'm especially pleased to launch my new book, Deep Hanging Out, at this event. It represents a good part of my life's work. It's a collection of my writing for the last 40 years and recounts my experiences with the California Indian community. Pre-contact California had the greatest population density north of Mexico City, and along with it, astonishing cultural diversity. There were over 500 independent nations and nearly 100 languages spoken. So really, there was no such thing as a California Indian. Each of these groups developed ways of life that were unique to their environment. People inhabited the California deserts in small family groups and traveled widely over the land in search of scarce water. The Chumash lived along the coast of Santa Barbara. Other peoples lived in the fertile Central Valley and in the oak woodlands of Sonoma County, some in villages over 1,000 people. They lived successfully and more or less continuously in these diverse places for thousands of years. And they adapted their lives to the land rather than changing the environment to suit their lifestyles. Each of these groups had accumulated a huge body of knowledge, customs, skills, and beliefs that comprise a cultural treasure of great magnitude. After thousands of years of living in a single place, the knowledge of how to live well is deeply embedded and reflected in every aspect of their culture in people's direct relationship to the land, in their spiritual beliefs, in their economic institutions, in their educational systems, and in their customs around warfare, trade, class structure, etc. Native cultures, as diverse as they were and are, share all the markers of a healthy society. And from there, I'm going to read to you from what Malcolm wrote in Deep Hanging Out, what he and um, his friend Jim Quay decided and wanted to share were the markers of a healthy society. This is from Deep Hanging Out, page 19. And as I read these, you can think about how this impacts our relationship to climate change and the relationship of traditional knowledge and indigenous wisdom to climate change. First, a sustainable relationship with the environment. In a healthy society, the present generation doesn't strip mine the soil, water, forests, minerals, leaving the future impoverished and the beauty of the world degraded. In a healthy society, there will be relatively few outcasts. In a healthy society, you will find relatively relative egalitarianism. The gap between those with the most wealth and power and those with the least should be moderate, and those with the least should feel protected, cared for, or rewarded in some other way. There should be widespread participation in the arts. There should be moderation or control of individual power. There should be economic security attained through networks of family, friendships, and social reciprocity, rather than through the individual boarding, hoarding of goods. And there should be a love of place, the feeling that one lives with emotional attachment to an area that is uniquely beautiful, abundant in natural resources, and rich in personal meaning. And knowing one's place in the world, a sense perhaps embodied in spiritual practice that the individual is a magnificent part of a larger, more abiding universe. It'll be a place where work is done willingly, or at least with a minimum of resentment. And finally, where there is lots of laughter. And with that, um, I'd like to um, pass it on to Paul, to Hawken, who many of you know, as I said earlier, is a phenomenal author and um, who's 
written so many books that have impacted our understanding of the, the present world. And in particular, his last two books have been focused on uh, ending and really recovering from the climate crisis. So Paul, um, one thing that Malcolm ended with was saying the current cultural revival of native people throughout the country and throughout the world of the Renaissance of um, leadership, action, engagement as, as exemplified by the work of Sue and Michelle has given us access as a general population in the world to more deep reservoirs of knowledge. How does that reflect in your new book, Regeneration and Ending the Climate Crisis, our conversation for tonight? Well, <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, I wanna say thank you to Malcolm a thousand times over. He's been such an inspiration to me for decades. and. The inspiration has been what he chose to really write about, but the way he did it, the, the, the gentleness, the kindness, the openness, the respect, uh, as opposed to being, with all due respect, an expert colonist, <laughs> which is what we see again and again and again, you know, and uh, especially in my gender. And um, <clears throat> so it's, it's, the way he's gone about this and the way he's gone about his life and heyday and so forth is it is a pedagogical it's a teaching unto itself you know and it's a teaching i've received with uh great gratitude um and and the constancy of it uh has been sort of like a not just a bellwether but maybe a compass in my own life so i just want to acknowledge that uh malcolm thank you thank you and thank you again um with respect to the phrase you just read, I want to go back to that phrase, the last sentence. Um, the To me, can you read that again? Because it's it's a very important distinction I want to make here about um, now that um, indigenous cultures are opening up. Can you read that part again? Sure. Uh, what Malcolm said was, and then we'll also go to Sue and Michelle for yeah. relevant commentary. Is, is that the current revival and renaissance mm. of native peoples and culture throughout the country, and I added throughout the world, enables us to have access as a culture and society to these deep reservoirs of knowledge that are going to be so essential for addressing the challenge of climate change. I, I completely agree. Um, the one thing I might say here is um, access was always there if we had been different people, if the settlers and colonists have been different. And so it's not as though indigenous people have opened up, you know, after, you know, 400, I mean, just centuries of horrific deracination. Uh, it's that the world is coming into a crisis. And I, I feel like what's happening is that people's all over, including the 5,000 indigenous cultures in the world, um, are um, are awakening and asserting their voice in a way that we've never seen before. Um, and partly it's because it's being heard and listened to, but same with black and brown and many other cultures. And so um, I think the legacy of the Eurocentric way of basically raping the world, of taking from the world, of degenerating the world, of uh, looking at resources as something that you turn into money, um, is it has come up, it's up, and it's being talked about, and it's being seen, and it's being felt, and it's being experienced. What's interesting to me about um, indigenous um, uh, tribes, cultures, nations, um, is the word indigen, indigene means original inhabitant. I mean, that's, it's a, you know, it's an English word, but, but it means that the, the persons in the cultural tribes who've been on the land from the beginning, from the outset, you know, and, and what I think we have to, uh, the the treasure that awaits us if we wake up and whoever us is that's a really good question I have to think about that one um, um, is is an understanding of place and and what I think we have sorely mistaken is that uh, indigenous knowledge was knowledge 
Okay. Well, it is, but actually it was observational science that was developed over thousands and thousands of years. And, and observational science is the science of place. And the science of place is different than empirical science. Empirical science, if you can't repeat it, it's not true. In nature, nothing repeats. So observational science was very much about the recognition and pattern recognition of the in, this complex interactions between people, ecosystems, pollinators, insects, waters, storms, clouds, snow. And these understandings developed over millennia. And they were encoded in the language, encoded in the songs, encoded in ceremony, encoded in ritual, and so forth. And there was, and so for the white perspective, was that they're illiterate, but in fact, they, but they, and I'm going to speak scientifically, is because we had no idea how big the hippocampus was. <laughs> and it's just people, their memory was extraordinary, extraordinary memory. And uh, so, the the, the 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 fundamental cause of global warming is actually is we don't know where we live i'm not saying everybody i'm just saying most people don't know where they live they've never been taught there's no respect there's no sense of connection and so there's this profound disconnection between people I mean, that's that's what we read about every day it's getting worse there's a profound disconnection between people and the living world and uh, there's a profound disconnection between nature itself now because of habitat fragmentation, acidification, poisoning, burning, deforestation, and all the ways in which we uh, extract it from nature. And so the regeneration of the world is something that is innate um, to all people, not just indigenous people, all people, because all 30 trillion of our cells regenerate every nanosecond or we wouldn't be here and having this conversation. And so regeneration is the default mode of life itself and so forth. And so I think of the Miwok, you know, and, and just a simple little example that I'll stop, you know, and so forth. But, you know, the what we called Indian potatoes, which is silly, it's Brodea and lilies, these beautiful lilies, Mariposa lily that were harvested in the late spring. And what they would do is, is it's a bulb and has three corms and they would take one corm and plant two. <laughs> it's like, that's regeneration and not take two and plant one. And so there, there was embedded in these cultures because regeneration was the way you um, carried forward. And there was a beautiful quote from Hindu Amaru Ibrahim. She's a Chadian pastoralist uh, from the Wudari um, tribe. And she said, yes, we think seven generations ahead, no question when we do something. But the reason we do that is because we can also remember what happened for seven generations in the past. And so we see both ways. And so we see ourselves as the continuity to, to life. And the idea of breaking that continuity was anathema. It's like unthinkable to us as a people, you know. And that is what we do not have in Eurocentric cultures. Thank you, Paul. I, I want to just comment that was very direct and relevant to the topic, but also Hindu uh, Ibrahim is a close friend who has uh, also been truly a significant player in the climate negotiations now for mm. at least a decade and is an inspirational yes. leader from um, Chad, I believe. Yes, Chad. From Chad in, in Africa. So thank you for quoting from Hindu. Um, I'd like to pass it on to Sue Mastin, who has been just, when we talk about uh, regeneration, and you mentioned, Paul, that we're disconnected from the land. Well, if there's someone who knows their land, it's uh, Susan Mastin. She has been a leader uh, both locally and nationally uh, here in California uh, many years ago with the salmon wars, a struggle over salmon rights and fishing rights up in the Northern Territories of California, but also as president of the National Congress of American Indians, as the chairperson of the American Indian Film Institute, which is where I first met her, and then more recently uh, organizing women's initiatives within the Native community, but always connected to her land here in Northern California. And uh, Susan, I just want to pass it to you to what, what thoughts in reflection of both uh, Malcolm's new book and 
Paul's uh, emphasis on regeneration. How does your tradition and culture and your own personal experience, where does it leave you today thinking about climate change and the future? Well, first, I just want to say that, you know, I've, I've always appreciated um, Malcolm's respect for um, the uh, local tribal communities and the way that he, um, he makes sure to um, interact with the, the community and to listen and to learn um, from our people and, um, and to tell our stories and not to um, tell our stories from his perspective, but to tell our stories through our own words. And so, and that's been the big difference between what he's written about um, the local people it's not been what he's written, it's been through our words. So it's been presented through our own words um, in, his, in his writings. And so I've always appreciated that from him. And unfortunately, um, I have seen him in different occasions, but have just recently gotten to um, interact with him. And, and that's the unfortunate piece about um, our relationship, because I think we would have had a very close bond had we met, you know, 40 years ago. And um, I could have uh, learned and shared much with him over the years. And so I regret that we are just becoming close at this late point in our lives, because um, there was much we could have shared. Um, I think that, you know, over the course of my time coming here, I came at a point when it was the Salmon Wars, and it was um, my uncle's court case that reaffirmed our fishing rights on the Klamath River. And I was actually living in um, San Francisco at the time. I had um, graduated from Oregon State University and was working in the city, and um, my family was calling me because uh, my uncle's uh, fishing case, he was a focal point for um, arrests um, for fishing, for, um, you know, he, they had come into his home in the middle of the night, got his family up under gunpoint in their 12 by, you know, um, 60 trailer looking for fish um, in the middle of the night. And so, you know, I mean, they're stopping him. He went to jail numerous times for exercising his fishing right. And his wife went to jail many times. And you know, nobody faces those kinds of things with felonies um, for just exercising a right, an inherent right. And so his Supreme Court case decision, you know, with reaffirming our rights and then to be on the river fishing and we had a, a very low abundance year. And so the government in its wisdom decided to close the Indian fishery. Well, um, the ocean fishery continued to fish and this ocean sport fishery continued to fish and the in-river uh, sport fishery was fishing. The only people sitting on the banks was the Indian fishery. And we had just won um, a court decision in the highest court in the land and the Indian fishermen couldn't figure out what the heck is going on. The government who is supposed to be, uh, who has a trust obligation and responsibility um, to the fishery and to the, to the Indian fishery is not upholding its responsibility. And so they protested. And that's what brought the federal agents in in full riot gear. They had M16s that they needed to protect the fish and full riot gear and helmets with shields and they were there to protect the fish. And so, you know, it was very intense and my family was extremely worried that um, my uncle would be killed in the process. And so every time they heard the large boats come down because they had rowboats, they would um, hurry to the river so that there could be witnesses um, in case he was killed. And so they were calling me because I um, had access to media to please come up and to bring media so that this could be witnessed because we were not getting any um, publicity. There was only negative publicity about the Indians over harvesting and that, um, you know, the bumper sticker of the day was can an Indian and save the salmon. And um, it was very bad and, and tense situations. And so, you know, at that time, um, 
they were very fearful for their lives and they did not want to talk to state or federal agents when that ended and um, it, it was a difficult time. So it, th there is, and it still is alive, environmental injustice. Um, and, um, and I hate to say it, but the dollar still does rule. It did then and it still does today. We see it in, in decisions that are made by our government for water and for, and at that time for fish, um, for money. Um, so when there were low populations, we still took, I went to meetings where I thought, oh, easy season. There's not enough fish. We're going to fish into the escapement. So there will be no fishing because the fish need to go towards escapement. And that's my mindset because that's how we think, you know, escapement first, provide for tomorrow. We're not going to fish. And there would be, oh, we're taking fish. You know, and so that's a mindset where I'm thinking, you know, no, no fishing because we have to protect the fish. We got to protect the fish for today and tomorrow. The other mindset is no, we need to fish. We need to take today. <laughs> you know, there, there is no tomorrow. Today we need to take the fish. And it's the same with the water um, today, which is, you know, 40 years later, you know, we got to take the water. Um, it doesn't matter about the fish. It doesn't matter about the other resources that depend on um, the water. We have to take the water up here for the farmers for, for the money. Um, and it doesn't matter that we have this ecosystem that depends on the water. Um, we need to make this money up here for, for this, the agriculture. And so take that. So when you talk about, okay, we're paying attention today because, you know, here we have all these fires, we have hurricanes, tornadoes, and we have COVID, which are all indicators that the world is terribly out of balance, that we need to wake up and pay attention and address this. Um, and a lot of it has to do with the climate, um, the climate and I think that um, indigenous knowledge is necessary. And I think that if we don't pay attention to those, those values that we have to offer, and I think women, and I'm glad to hear that you are part of that women, because I think women and indigenous people, because we all want to look for tomorrow and we care about our children and future generations that we're the ones that are gonna step forward to be able to help to create that, that change that is necessary to address this imbalance. And from coming from our perspective, the creator gave us a responsibility. He said, here's this world and I provide everything for you. Your responsibility is to take care of it and to ensure that it's here for future generations and that everything has a purpose and you have to respect each of those things because everything is interconnected. And so you have a respect for each of it because each thing is interconnected and dependent on each other. And so everything that walks, swims, crawls, flies, each of that is important and needs to be respected in the same way. And so if you have respect for each thing and your decision making and your values system is placed on taking care of and ensuring that it's protected for tomorrow, then you are not going to cause harm for what is your responsibility to care for. So I don't know how much you want me to go on because there's other people who need to talk and there's so much to say and so little oh, time. Thank you so much, Sue. I'm sorry I was muted. That was beautiful. And I'm going to follow what you just said with a very brief passage from Deep Hanging Out and then pass it on to Michelle LaPena who speaking about fighters for the land has been so involved with fighting for native people's rights here in California and in other parts of the country, but also is, um, been a big supporter of the campaign to save the West Berkeley Shell Mound and can share with us the kinds of initiatives that are going and a big uh, as also co-chair of 
the Ind Indigenous Advisory Board for the California Institute for Community Art and Nature, playing many roles in helping us pull our programs forward. But from deep hanging out, what we now call conservation was an everyday practice of the native people of California, embedded in religious belief, social structures, good manners, and just everyday habit. It was spread so widely over so many cultural practices that it's difficult to sum up, impossible to define. Yet surely there is a sentence in uh, my colleague's Ruth Roberts article that he references in the book that bears deep thought. And this re referenced directly what both Susan said and what Paul said about the Brodea and the Miwok people. And I quote from Ruth Roberts, to destroy wildlife, for any other reason than to meet his or her need of food would have been as ridiculous a procedure to the native Californian as if we entered our own gardens or went among our own herds and destroyed them for the sheer enjoyment of our pr prowess as destroyers. For the first Europeans who settled in California, the land was a wilderness. It belonged to no one. Its wealth was here for the taking. Certainly too much of that attitude remains today, worked into our laws, our institutions, and our daily habits. To native people who have lived here for thousands of years, however, and whose actions shaped the landscape, it was indeed and is a garden, a garden that needed tending and care and that rewarded such efforts with bountiful food, a sustainable way of life, and an environment of almost unimaginable health, vigor, and beauty. Michelle LaPena, uh, Indigenous rights attorney, champion for the land and for your peoples, um, and fan of Malcolm Margolin. How do you respond to that? Oh, wow, it's, it's such a, an amazing uh, concept that he's presenting there. And it, it really does tie into, you know, the idea that native knowledge is so important to address climate change because um, I think it's been touched on um, and I, it's kind of interesting how things work out. I, I happened upon um, a video of Vine Deloria earlier this morning, just by accident. And, um, and he was talking about the difference between native and non-native people. And he focused on commercialism, which is something that was referenced earlier in Paul's um, comments um, I, in, in a way um, that the difference is between you know settler ideology and native um, thinking is commercialism versus um, in many ways the, the versus the other side of it would be giving and or redistribution and um, and sharing and for the that's referenced quite a bit in in you know in the, in deep hanging out um, Malcolm talks about where traditional leaders learn how to be leaders and it's through our creation stories. And the creation stories talk about leaders not having power, but they have a responsibility. And the responsibility is to ensure that everybody is taken care of. Um, and so there's a big element of redistribution in our, in, and I can't speak for all, but in, in many of California's native communities, um, and it always, I always think of a, a quote that I've re quoted many times of Malcolm's from the Ohlone Way, uh, a book he wrote um, many years ago. And the saying of the Ohlone people was um, that he wrote of the Ohlone's was to be wealthy was not to have, but to be wealthy was to give. And the idea that there's a giving uh, community or a giving way is part of native people's lives and it, and it does reserve resources because um, it allows for what is available to be shared. And that involves, you know, plants, our animal, our foods um, that come from plants and animals. Um, and I can think of my own family, my great, great, great grandmother on my Kahuya side um, from Southern California. Um, her role in the community in her tribe was to redistribute um, and allocate mesquite. And in the in pre-colonial days, 
the Coachella Valley was a forest and we would never imagine it today because it's a, it's a desert and there's just brush and sage and there's very few mesquite trees. But when in my ancestors' times, there were forests of mesquite um, in the Coachella Valley. And my grandmother, her role was to ensure that she um, cared for the mesquite groves knew what was going on with the mesquite, knew which ones were producing seed and um, the pods and which ones weren't and which areas could be allocated and, and what the needs were in the community so that everybody had their share and nobody got to hoard, no one got to um, take. They all were given permission to use the resources. And that is a big law. I think that's a, a law that is part of most tribal communities, an ancient law. Um, and, and what Sue was talking about with the fishery, they would have, I'm sure I'm not Yurok and I can't speak to the specific law, but I'm assuming there was laws about use of the fish and, and who could fish in certain places and at what time and for how long. And we did that to make sure everybody could have something and no one went without. And so the leaders were often, the, they would gather wealth but they gathered it to be distributed to others. So they might be the least wealthy person in the tribe at the end of the day, because everything they gave, they had, they gave away. Um, and so I think that is our greatest, you know, knowledge or principle in our tribal communities is about giving. Um, and unfortunately that was our greatest weakness. Um, you know, it resulted in the loss of our land, the loss of our culture, um, cultures and our ways of life because we didn't always know when we were giving something that someone was taking it forever. Um, you know, a temporary gift or a borrowing or a sharing of something, uh, a basket, um, land, access to a river may have been a temporary grant of right of use, but to a non-Indian settler, it was an author's authority to take it. Um, so our giving culture has been transformed into, you know, it was used by a commercialist um, ideology. And so, um, you know, the great thing is we're still here. And that's what I think is so present in this, in, in, in Malcolm's book, as the Native people are still here. And it says that a few times about people saying we're still here. Um, but there's a quote in here, um, and he's talking about Frank Lapina, who is my, um, my late father-in-law, who passed away a few years ago. And there's a quote in here um, with this from him that says, when there are no more Indians, then we will end. When the songs and the dances are forgotten, and when our language is forgotten, and when we do not honor the earth, because we have forgotten all living things on earth are sacred and important, then the world will end. But just before that time, we will know the time of emptiness. And, you know, I do feel we're, we're in a little bit of that emptiness, um, but we do still have our practice, our cultures, and we do still have our songs. Um, I was just at a tribal event where songs were, were, sent, were sung, um, you know, funeral rites were given, and we do still have our ways. Um, and we do have to really protect them today because we can't give them away anymore. Um, but I do think we're in a period where we can share um, and hopefully that sharing can be respected in a way now in today's society. I think there's more respect for what we're offering the world than there was in the past when it was just taken. So I do think that there is an opportunity here for our, our knowledge of sharing and um, giving to be incorporated in a new society if people are open to it. Thank you so much, Michelle. That was really quite profound. And uh, taking it back to Paul, I, I'm looking to see if there's any questions. There, um, I don't see any Q and A in the um, in the chat yet. But uh, Paul, your book is about ending the climate crisis in one generation and both Michelle and Susan have spoken eloquently about the traditions, the ways of life, the approach to being on earth that uh, traditional and indigenous peoples have had that, that's reinforced the possibility of not only ending the climate crisis, but going into more a situation of sustainability on into the future. 
what are some of the positive solutions that you are seeing and how are you seeing people draw on that from traditional knowledge or from other uh, solutions that you are offering in your new book that are relevant to what we're talking about tonight? Well, one thing I'm seeing is I'm wondering why 98% of the world is disengaged from the greatest crisis we've ever faced as a civilization. If, if we can call ourselves a civilization en masse, I'm not sure that's true, but we have civilizations within it. And I think it has to do with the way we've spoken it, the way the language we use around it, and the language it was even in the introduction, how we can reverse climate change. That's the last thing we want to reverse. The climate is supposed to change. It's perfect. Climate is always perfect. It's feedback. Um, it's an expression of the atmosphere and the biosphere. We have two words for that. Um, but in fact, they're the same thing. One is solid, one is gaseous, but the earth is one system. And um, <clears throat> so the way we've talked about it by fighting, tackling, combating, using war metaphors, male war metaphors, and sports metaphors to describe climate is we're doing exactly the same thing that caused the problem, which is we're othering. We're making climate othering. Bill Gates, we're going to fix it. It, really? Let me see, find it. Where? Show me. <laughs> I'm curious, you know. What is it? And so that mindset is, of course, so we've othered other peoples, other civilizations, other cultures, other races, other religions, other ways of life, a whole gender. That was interesting. That's what the Me Too movement was pointing out. Uh, Islamophobia more recently and so forth. So we have a language around this that is actually the mental cause, the, 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 actually the, the um, disease, if you will, of, of thinking, the causes where we are today. And so I think, I mean, the number one uh, teaching uh, that, w that is there for us and so forth is cultures that don't make that distinction because the distinction doesn't exist. If we say, as a, as a white person, if I say, well, I, uh, you know, nature, I'm, I'm not separate from nature. I just did separate myself from nature <laughs> in the syntax, in my sentence. I just did it. And so we have to, and the, the language that informed the longevity of the tribes and the cultures and that we hear are very, very different than English, which is a very explicit language, very useful in many ways, but it causes separation, you know. And I think that is the cause for disengagement, because people go, well, uh, that's, uh, that's, I don't know what to do, or I hope somebody does it, or what is, what are we talking about here? And so um, I think that, you know, understanding that, like I say, the climate couldn't be nothing but perfect because it's an expression of the atmosphere, the biosphere of this planet, this beautiful, holy, sacred place upon which we are blessed to live. And so nature never makes a mistake. We do. So and Paul, so, with yeah. that, um, we've had a couple of questions and I'm also going to yeah. pass it back to Sue, Michelle, yeah. and back to you um, from, the, from the listeners and the audience. Um, one is a very specific question, and um, I can address it myself, or Sue and uh, Michelle may be able to fill in, or Paul, that there was a question about renewable energy projects on native lands. And I, I know there's quite a few. There's um, that uh, Wahila Johns and others have worked on various solar and renewable energy projects. It would be, people were interested to know what, what very specific projects do you know of that are taking place on, on tribal lands? Um, someone uh, also, that was uh, from uh, Annie Moose, and then Meg Beeler asked, says, Paul, I love your ideas and wonder how heart, seeing with heart, fits into the foci of regeneration, the six foci, and how do we support all the agendas if we don't stay in our hearts? Mm -hmm. um, a high school teacher said, what steps can we take as teachers in urban public schools that are action steps towards consciousness about climate with few resources and everybody's crazed by just life itself. But we need messages of hope towards and with young minds and it's hard. Yeah. And, um, 
Oh, and finally, someone said, yes, will the recording of this panel be available? It certainly will. And let's take uh, any or all of those that you wish to adjust, mm -hmm. and also just your own comments. Back to you, Sue Maston. Yeah, so I was just talking to my mom about being on this panel, and she goes, it was probably about 40 years ago, my grandpa was just looking around going, you know, there's going to be huge fires around here if they don't burn this underbrush like we used to do a long time ago. And so he was talking about how we used to burn cultural burning um, in our practices to take care of things. So we would burn so that our basket materials would be fresh and we would burn so that um, the feed for the deer and the elk and we would you know, burn for the berries. We'd, we'd have these cultural burns that kept um, it from being large fires but helped for the environment, for the deer, for the berries, for you know our basket materials. And they were regulated burns that we did on a regular basis. And so um, the Urox, our upper reservation, um, began to do this. I think about 20 years ago, we started to do some cultural burns upriver and they are, um, they are continuing to do those cultural burns on a, on a yearly basis now um, so that, that we can control those fires and to you know, get back to those practices for our gathering sites and to have um, you know, those grounds for um, our wildlife for having better eating um, conditions. So it's it's been wonderful to see that evolve. And I got to play some role in coordinating the community with the, the tribe um, and our resources at the tribe to help them be able to do that and um, to coordinate with the um, state um, also because um, you can't just have these wild burns in the middle of the summer in the fire season. Um, and not have some concerns. And so now, you know, they have um, have trained the neighboring tribe and um, and it's really exciting to see that happen that we've brought that cultural practice back into place and it's getting some, you know, um, national attention and, um, and being, uh, allowing for some revitalization of that practice in other areas. And, and being looked at by um, state and national parks as a way to manage within um, you know, their park system. So that's a wonderful thing to see happen and something that um, I'm very proud that our it came initiative that came from you know, the community itself as a way to revitalize something that was of our own um, and a way to take care of our lands again. So. Very exciting for us. Yes, also there are numerous um, solar projects in Indian country. And for those of you who aren't aware, the largest pockets of um, energy and untapped energies, of course, are in Indian country. And I don't know if most of you are aware of that. And I think um, also for those of you who aren't aware, because we are so interconnected with our land and our resources, we are also have a lot of knowledge about what's occurring um, with, with the climate um, and um, with the changes with the resources, with the water, with, you know, the glaciers, with um, species, with, you know, um, with resources because we on a daily basis see it because we're the gathering, we're fishing, we're, um, you know, we're just utilizing, we're out there every day um, with those, with the resources. So we see on a daily basis what's occurring. Um, we see that the runs are, are uh, the salmon runs are different, that the timings are different. We see that, that the water levels are changing, that, you know, we see that the coastal waters are changing. We see all of those things that other people may not notice um, because they're not connected so closely with the, the land and the water um, and its resources. And, and most all of us, you know, live in those places <laughs> that you would, would see all of those changes that are occurring within nature. Um, 
more closely and more readily. And so um, that's a key also. Um, and just that um, traditional knowledge and that ancestral knowledge that comes through um, that we have um, that is is carried through with us um, for you know all of those since the beginning of time that is invaluable for um, that that we just have inherent knowledge and I guess uh, and as well as living in you know on the lands and that connection with the lands um, is invaluable and if we're if we want to really address um, what's going on today um, it's it's critical that the peoples, the first peoples of the land be at the table, having those discussions along with, you know, the scientists um, and, you know, looking for um, how we, um, how we address things in this day and time and ways that we can um, find solutions for like cultural burns, you know, that are things that we can do um, today. And solar projects or whatever else there is that makes you know good sense and i'm really pleased that there are some teachers you know that are in our audience because there are some things that we can do in in teaching in our classrooms about the history and the true history that happened with native peoples in california and there's curriculum that that is available for um, schools and that is a good way to introduce your your students and if you are interested in things i'm sure malcolm knows but i also have some resources and would be happy to um share my contact information um through um with you um so that we can get some resources to you but there's some really easy ways that you can share with your students that that are cost effective and um easy for you to do and um, and I would be more than happy to do a Zoom meeting with your class at any time that, that you wanted. And, um, and I'm always excited to, to share with students. So I offer that to you too. Fantastic, Susan. And um, just to add what, to what you were saying is that the, um, I remember some, even as far as 30 years ago, the analysis of the um, the uh, in the National Energy Agency was that all of the electricity needs in the US could be powered by wind in the 11 Midwestern states, Midwestern and Plains states, many of those that are on a tribal lands. So it's it's not a question of, uh, of is it possible? It's just how do we get there? Yeah. You know, what do we do to make it happen? Michelle, uh, back to you on uh, this whole topic of the solutions and um, response to what Paul was and Sue have both said. And, and for those who uh, tuned in late, um, Malcolm, uh, actually, and Malcolm just gave me a comment in the chat, which I'm going to read, um, because for those of you that didn't know, Malcolm is, uh, has decided to not speak very much tonight because of uh, his underlying condition of Parkinson's, but I am going to call on him at uh, seven o'clock if you would like to make some comments but instead he's he's taken advantage of the chat to say how about we pick up the conversation from, from where michelle took it before back to the underlying values and practices that pertain to climate change things like names on the land like the property laws like the political structure like the education of children the belief that land has power and that also brings me to um mm -hmm. one more quick reading from deep hanging out that malcolm asked me to read which is individuals so dominate our modern sense of being, we often name places after people. And Pitt River is no exception. A modern map of the area bears names such as Clayton Canyon, Bernie Falls, Pittville, McGee Peak, and a host of others. I can't help but wonder, did anyone ever ask the peak whether it wanted to be named McGee? In the world into which my friend Daryl was born, in contrast, place to find and name the person. My native name, Sudma et Jote, Daryl once explained, is an act of culture referring to the landscape where I was born on the north bank of Sudma et Jote, Fall River, also called Fall River Mills. In a 2007 interview with Indian Times, a publication from UC Riverside, Daryl explained his name and his identity in this manner. My connection to my mother and to the earth is in the Fall River Valley, there beside the Fall River. Therefore, my native name must show that connection. I am Suma Ejote, 
There is only one Soma Ejote, the river, recognized by the great universal powers. In the recent past, all males were named for the landscape of their birth. In this manner, anyone would know you, your birthplace, your genealogy, and your history just by your name. Michelle, that was actually back to your territory. Yeah, yeah, and that, it kind of reminded me of some of my notes in reading um, Deep Hanging Out. There's, there's so many stories, you know, the, the book is really Malcolm talking, giving us a picture and telling us where, what he learned and, and many of those experiences he had with, with Native people across the state. And uh, there's a, a chapter that's talking about his time with Preston Arrowweed down in, um, in the Kumeyaay lands at, at Quetzon. And they're talking about cremations and cremations being part of the place and, and how when Native people, uh, basically my note to myself from this whole chapter was there's really not a separation between life and death um, that we we live in this land, our ancestors lived in this land and we've always been in this land. And it's an incredibly powerful thing to be able to say, I'm, I'm from this land, um, which is what the reading just was talking about, that the land and the person are the same because we come from the land. And it's one of the things that I, I do feel sad sometimes for non-native people that aren't from living where they're from originally, where their homeland might be. Um, some, you know, they, they don't have that connection to the land. Although some, you know, ranchers and people that have lived for many generations can, you know, make those kinds of claims about living, you know, having ties to the land. Um, but for native people going back for, for eons, for, for, tens of thousands of years, it brings a level of knowledge that it's hard to express to a non-native person that we're living where our people lived, we're living where our people died, we're living where generations and generations have lived and died, like at the Shell Mounds in West Berkeley um, and in the Bay Area and all across Northern California, actually along the coast, there were Shell Mounds, um, which you know, marked the fact that those generations lived in that place for hundreds, if not thousands of years and, and recognized that um, at the point of contact. And then fortunately, you know, with contact that, that line was broken for some, or at least disturbed for some, and they've had to reclaim that connection to those places. And then other tribes, you know, where th there wasn't a, re a, a removal, um, uh, or genocidal um, overtaking of the land, like maybe up in your country, um, you know, the, that still exists. And so that sense of being part of the place, the sense that time is different. Um, and I remember reading something, I think it might have been Winona LaDuc that was talking about um, and I'm sorry if it wasn't her, but I'm pretty sure it was her. She was talking about how, you know, there's cycles of the earth, there's cycles of the land, there's cycles of the plants and of the animals. And there's, you know, the annual cycle where we have spring, fall, winter, the seasons. Um, and then there's many, you know, five-year cycles or maybe eight-year cycles where things kind of come and go and migration patterns for elk or different herds or maybe monarchs or, you know, different species that might be bigger than a year. It might be many, many years between certain things happening. Um, but she was talking about cycles that might happen at 50 or 100 year cycles that only Native people would know these cycles. And, and they recorded those histories in their oral tradition about the time when these things happen. And, and so when it happens again, maybe 100 years later, that people know that what's expected that this is expected, that this, oh yeah, this is the time when they do this. Um, and so it's a unique understanding and tie to the land. Um, and unfortunately the actions that we've been, that you know, our, our, our society has, the decisions that have been made for, you know, our government, by our governments um, to move water from one place to another, to drill oil from inside the earth, um, 
to use those materials in a way that they weren't intended to be used by the earth, you know, because those tars and those oils could come, they're in the earth. They're actually the remains of our ancestors. They were remains of what was here before. And they serve a function in the earth. They, they lubricate it. And they are kind of like the grease that keeps the gears running inside the earth. And as we take it out, we remove that grease inside the earth. And then we have earthquakes because there's not that kind of shifting because the earth is alive and we know it's alive and people forget, I think that it's alive. But as Sue was saying, when you live in the place and you, you eat from the place and you die and are buried in that place, you have a connection that is, um, has a respect for the place uh, and you'll have a deeper understanding of the place. Um, and so when those, those cycles are interrupted, the, the oil is removed, the water is put into canals. Um, there's a misunderstanding of, of what the purpose of these resources are. And uh, I know we were talking the other day in anticipation of this event, and I pointed out that there's signs in Central California along the freeway that say, don't let our water flow into the ocean. And from a native perspective, that makes no sense because that's where water goes. Water flows through the rivers and the creeks and it flows into the ocean and there's a system in place that lives on that water. Um, so to not let it run into the ocean is, is a very strange idea. And it's, a, it's an idea that can only be understood and make sense to somebody that is absolutely removed from the land and only sees water as their personal property and a resource for them to consume. So it's a very different kind of experience. Um, and I do wanna just add one little thing about fire, um, how Sue mentioned fire and control burning, which is a lot, is, it's talked about in, um, in Malcolm's book about the controlled burns and the basket weavers restoring the, um, the cultural burns into the forest um, for the basket materials and for the food and for the, you know, regeneration of the trees because trees, many of the pines need fire to be germinated um, and to make new, new trees. Um, and so the, it's, it, there is a rise of the tribal fire departments and tribal fire departments don't just put out fires. Tribal fire departments today are starting fires, but they're starting cultural fires and they're making sure that those fires don't get out of control. And so I think that's just sort of a dichotomy that's very, very interesting that, you know, Sacramento, can, Sacramento Fire Department puts out a fire, but the Shingle Springs Band of Miwok Indians Fire Department they're, they're making fires and they're controlling the fires and they're creating the, they're cutting the, the, the tinder down and they're making it a safer place for fire. So, so I just want to well, close with that. That is so um, important what you've been sharing. And I, I want to just check with Laura, our, uh, our host. Can we go past 710? Absolutely. Um, but I think we'd like to turn this over to Pam to start reading some of the questions in the Q&A. Well, uh, hang on just one yeah. quick second, because sure. I know Sue, Sue just wanted to make one more comment and then also sure. um, there are a lot of questions in the Q&A. Maybe she can consolidate them. And um, if the panelists are willing, could we go on uh, to 720 and not stop at 710? This conversation is so rich and some of the questions are really wonderful. So how about she read two or three at once rather than trying to you know, consolidate them rather than answer them. while she's consolidating. Sue, just a quick comment back to you and then we'll get some questions. Okay, and I hate to open this to a whole nother thing, but I really feel like there's some wonderful people in this audience and in this panel and it's causing me a lot of concern over the last couple of months. And that is this movement towards creating some animosity between, between color. And I'm, I'm really concerned about that um, because there's this big climate, but there's this whole movement to um, cause this internal kind of thing within our country and um, with, with black against Asian or, you know, or Asian against brown or, you know, it's just, just this undercurrent that I see going in our country and um, it, it worries me a lot about that and how 
how that's going to be addressed and and where we begin to think about that because it it's going to hit us and i i would rather see uh, minds that we have on this panel and in this audience begin to be thinking about that before it's too late and that's I don't want to spin us at such a late hour, but I just, if people could begin to think of this so that we're not caught at a late hour and no one's thinking about this. Thank you, Sue. And let me pass it to Pam, Pam of the Mechanics Institute to consolidate a few questions. And then also Malcolm in this round, uh, since we have 13 minutes left, we'd love to hear, hear from you. I know everybody would like to hear from you. I know it might be difficult, but how about we hear from all our speakers again with these consolidated questions and then we'll um, come back to you. So Pam, please go ahead. Well, the questions in Q&A, um, they it's not hard to consolidate them because they seem to be um, on a theme of how we um, incorporate the Native American approach. Um, Dot uh, Gillen said, is it possible to speak of a reproachment of paradigms of a process of change? How might our practices help us better handle differences in values and viewpoint? Um, John Calloway asks, how do we effectively integrate Western scientific knowledge with traditional ecological knowledge? Can the two work together? And are there any specifics about how they have worked together eff effectively? And um, Louise Dunlap asks, as a descendant of early Yankee settlers in Northern California, I'm paying a lot of attention to the efforts among white landowners now to return land to indigenous control. Do any of us know of examples in our region that are helping to address climate change? Mm. Fantastic. Um, who'd like to start? Paul, Michelle? Paul, any examples you know of integration of traditional ecological knowledge um, and um, modern scientific approach? It's happening everywhere in the world. Science or <clears throat> scientists let's not call them scientists, let's call them ecologists, botanists, anthropologists, um, <clears throat> people who, um, who's, whose work um, is intimately involved with the original inhabitants, particularly in, <clears throat> in the 82% uh, you know, of the biodiversity in the world is uh, contained in, in uh, actual tribal lands, you know, and the 5,000 indigenous cultures, and that's about four or five percent of the people, but 82 percent of the biodiversity. And so there's a lot of um, interchange about that, which is how, why is that? I mean, I mean, so <laughs> Michelle can tell you right away why that's true. But I mean, the point is that from an ecological point of view, they there's an openness there to understand what are the cultural practices there that are able to maintain intact ecosystems where the rest of the world the losses of biodiversity are huge. Yeah, I might also add that um, in the project that I spoke about in, uh, in my bio and the website is the Conversations with the Earth, Indigenous Voices on Climate Change exhibit that was at the Smithsonian in 2011, 2012. Mm. One of the prime examples was the development of a potato park in the Andes, which is using modern agricultural knowledge together with traditional knowledge to re, to, um, well, to plant and to generate uh, over 300 species of potato that are endemic to, to uh, the Andes. And one of the ironies of climate change in the Andes is that as the, uh, the glaciers recede, uh, the people, the traditional peoples have to go further up the mountains to, um, to plant potatoes. On the other hand, they're now able to plant corn at some of the lower elevations. So they're sort of what Paul was saying. It's, you know, it's not, the, they're adapting. They're adapting to the climate and making it work for their tradition. So Michelle or Sue, would you like to yeah, uh, speak I, I would, that? Well, I would like to sort of um, just bounce off of the comments that are in the chat to um, talking about the difference between extractive um taking and there were some comments about you know what's the difference between sharing and not having it taken and and i would just circle back to malcolm's book the book is um, a, an expose on how to share how to receive indigenous knowledge and um and cultural traditions and our teachings and not take it um, but he's sharing it 
with others. He's passing it on, um, but he didn't make it his own. He's, he's telling us what the native people said. He hasn't taken in all of these stories and made it his philosophy that he will teach others about natives through his version of it. He's actually sharing what we have said. Um, and there's a lot of profiteering that can go on with native sharing of our traditions and cultures and our ideas and thoughts about, you know, TEK, the traditional um, environmental knowledge and, um, and native thoughts and native, as Paul said, um, our, this knowledge is in science. Science is based on our traditional ecological knowledge. Um, we have aspirin because we have willow. <laughs> you know, there's so many um, medicines that come from the plant that we know how to use and we were using it and others watched and then they used it to make the medicines that we all buy at the store today. Um, our native uh, traditional ecological knowledge is, is embedded in our society. Unfortunately, it's been commercialized. And, and so I guess the teaching that we might want to have is, is more about sharing um, and acknowledgement, you know, even these land acknowledgements um, and, and returning, uh, you know, the land back initiatives that are out there, which was also asked about. Um, people are returning land to native people. Uh, they often have questions on how to do that um, but there are different, many, many legal ways to return land to the native people to entrust them with their properties and whether they're cultural properties, or cultural sites, or they are just someone's home that then can be repurposed by a tribe for the benefit of native people and the community that it's serving. Um, those, those options are out there. So I'm sorry, I probably didn't answer your questions, Claire, but hopefully I answered a couple in the chat. That was fantastic. And um, I just wanted to add, uh, yes, go ahead, Sue. Sorry. Um, I just wanted to, of course, because the, the one of the main things that's happening here locally is the removal of the dams. And I, I want to say that in the 40 years that I've been home on the river, um, we have a, lost a species um, and have four threatened listed species. And so I'm really excited about the removal of the dams because um, it has been shown that the, um, the ecosystem repairs itself rather quickly um, once that happens. And um, I'm excited to see what that means for um, the Klamath River ecosystem and, and the species and, and the peoples who depend on um, you know, the river um, for our way of life, what that, what that will bring to us in the coming years. So um, that is um, something that can happen and will happen. And I just want to leave with everyone's thoughts of, um, you know, we all, we all have a, have a responsibility in this world and we all need to look at um, being good ancestors, you know, and, and what is our legacy going to be and how do we want to leave um, this world for our children and our grandchildren and, um, uh, I, for one, want to be a good ancestor, and um, and I live my life and um, and am conscious of um, my decisions and and the choices I make in my life um, to make a difference. And so, I just um, hope that everyone else who's out there um, begins to just take a look at you know what we do in our daily lives and how we can make that that difference to be a good ancestor. Well, and, and speaking that, um, I'm going to put one thing in the chat, and then we're going to pass it to Malcolm. Malcolm, I don't know if you've been following the chat, but there's an outpouring of, of clamoring to, to hear from you. And um, just for those who want to know about action that can be taken, starting next week, there's going to be a week against extractive industries of fossil fuels, direct action in Washington, D.C., where thousands of people are, are expected. I've put a uh, a notice from the Indigenous Environmental Network in the chat. There's also many articles, but it, any ways you can look to support the groups that are there and are going to be there risking arrest all next week. It's one of the most important actions that's taken place in the last two years. And Malcolm, we're all here because of you. Um, please uh, share your thoughts if you wish. Thank you. So I, um, 
Ja. Uh, I'm, so, I'm so grateful to everybody for being here, all my friends and, and Paul and Michelle and Susan and you, Claire, and you, Laura, and also Pam. And it's, it's, it, it, hell. It feels like a real, 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 real community of people that's been built up over the years. And I think that among the among the things that I've learned about from California Indians is a sense of humility and the sense that the world is bigger than our capacity to understand it. And, and that, and, and I think, and I think that, 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 our, that our culture has a sense of using knowledge to conquer things and using language to, to control. And I think California Indians use language to express wonderment and to express and to and to and to appreciate the world. And I, 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 I think we, 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 we have so much to learn from California Indians, and it has to do with with a, a sense of propriety, a sense of proportion, a sense of uh, a sense, a sense, a sense that the what the what 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 into the world, and maybe if he or she is lucky, knowledge will come to them. And I think this is something about the world. The world is a teacher, and something about how I think the 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 <laughs> the important things we have to know are embedded in the land around us, and they're embedded in, in, in rocks that have stories, in myths, and then in the movements of animals. <laughs> I think 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 I and I'd like to wrap up the evening also to say thank you to Malcolm. You are truly our inspiration uh, for all these years of your work, your writing, your community uh, cultivation and outreach. Um, we've just been so inspired by you and also your work at Hey Day Books and also your new work at ICANN. So I wanna thank uh, Claire Greensfelder, who's our moderator from the California Institute uh, for Community Art and Nature and our guest Susan Maston and also to Michelle de Pe Pena and also to Paul Hawken. And I've made a note in the chat where you can also purchase their books. Um, Deep Hanging Out as we've done tonight and also Regeneration. So once again, thank you for this reflective and thoughtful and inspiring evening. And we hope that you'll join us again for our next programs. And good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you good so much, much, Laura.
<laughs> and thank you for all the beautiful messages in the chat. We really appreciate them. We, we are going to, I've saved it and we will read them all. Yes, thank Good you. Everyone. Thank you, Malcolm. Good night.